I am thrilled to be here to talk to you guys about something that I'm immensely passionate about, which is eliminating the friction tax and moving cryptocurrency forward towards mass adoption. So what exactly is friction tax? Has anyone heard this term before, friction tax? No. So friction tax is essentially each point prior to purchase, each point of contact prior to purchase, that costs a user in some way and diminishes the value of the product that they're trying to access. And basically each point of this friction in this process starts to lose subsets of users. And we see that the users that do stick around are often forced to make a large investment, either of time or frustration, sometimes even of money, before they're ever able to use the product and gain that value that they were initially trying to get. This, again, over time starts to lose more users, and the users that do stick around find that the value is not necessarily obvious. Why am I using this app if it's so hard to get into? This issue is caused by a number of things. Uh, primarily the overuse of industry-specific jargon in a lot of the applications that we see. Every new technical industry has its own you know, jargon and its own acronyms and things of that nature, and that's great, but it really shouldn't spill over into the user's hands because it just serves to confuse them. It causes a lack of accessibility. And because there are, what, 2,000 cryptocurrencies now and even more dApps and applications out there, we're seeing that there's a lack of interoperability and users are forced to learn new applications all the time because there's no standardization whatsoever across the board or very little standardization. Of course, we have the issue of mismanaged teams or untrustworthy teams, but also the issue of forking. Um, now, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of open source technology. If something has an MIT open license, go ahead, fork it. But what we're seeing is actually mainly just copy and pastes of other coins or other projects, which causes persisting issues when it comes to the, the things I talked about earlier with accessibility and usability. A lot of people say, like, we're in the DSL era or we're in the dial-up era. I, I actually disagree. I think we're in the ordering from a catalog era. You guys ever order from a catalog uh, product back in the day? I'm sure some of you have. It actually required you to send in a check to whichever catalog you were trying to buy a product from. It caused a lot of friction. Eventually, they added you know, debit card. We could call over the phone, but people didn't really trust that. Eventually, you could see stuff online. And now, of course, we have things like Amazon and, and that type of thing. They, over time, eliminated that friction tax and made it as accessible as it is now, where you're getting uh, deliveries in two days, whatever. That's what we need to focus on in cryptocurrency if we want to see any sort of mass adoption. But it starts from the onboarding process. Onboarding is by far the most important touch point that you will have with your customer or your user. You can lose the user forever if the onboarding process is, is flawed. It's because users have this sort of innate, even if it's subconscious, this inherent sense of risk versus reward. Users will actually take an action if they feel something good will come of it. And this is true with any industry, but it's most uh, relevant in tech, in the web and mobile. Expectations now have been set over the past 20, 30 years since the inception of the internet. Mobile applications, web applications are pretty much flawless at this point outside of the crypto space. So it's really important that we try to meet those expectations and try to exceed them as well. And each, pro each step in the process of onboarding should make the user feel like they're just one step closer to the goal, one step closer to that value that, they, that you promised them in the beginning. I like to use the example of the cartoon character sort of drifting toward the pie that's on the window. So you guys have seen commercials or uh, cartoons like that, I'm sure. In this, in this instance, your user is Bugs Bunny. Your user is, <coughs> excuse me, is Mickey Mouse and your product is the pie sitting on the windowsill. The minute they lose the whiff, that smoke trail in the air, the minute they lose that, you've lost the customer. They're gone. So I actually took it upon myself. I wanted to do a little experiment and see how does Bitcoin onboard new users. If I was completely dry, if I had nothing, to, no knowledge of Bitcoin whatsoever, but I really wanted to buy Bitcoin, how would I start? I'd start at Google. How do I get Bitcoin? Of course, I'm gonna click the first link, which is bitcoin.org. That looks pretty legit, right? <laughs> and I get this sort of one, two, three, four step 
process. The issue with this process is that you have four calls to action with four large buttons, and all of them lead to different places. You're also looking at a text-heavy screen that the user's probably not going to read. In fact, there's only one thing on this screen that I, as the user, searching for how to buy Bitcoin, want, and that's the Buy Bitcoin button. So I'm going to skip everything else and immediately click that. And I'm led to a page with no buttons. So we went from tons of buttons to no buttons and no calls to action. Now I'm confused and I leave the page. If I stick around because I really want Bitcoin, maybe I go to uh, the next link, which is, I'm just going to go to Coinbase because the second link is actually a blog. So Coinbase. Well, this looks a lot better. Has anyone used Coinbase before to buy Bitcoin? Not to buy, no one? Not. One person? OK. So I get to this page, it looks a lot better, right? A three-step process. This is digestible. I can get through this. Sign up, connect your bank, buy and sell. I can do that. So let's sign up. Standard form. That's great. I get the email to verify my email address. I go back to the page and add my phone number. They send me the confirmation code. And now I have to verify my identity. What? <laughs> I was never told that I need to verify my identity. In fact, I thought this crypto thing was about being anonymous. Whatever, I really want to buy Bitcoin, so I'm going to go ahead and fill this stuff out. Great. On step 12 now, I can actually go ahead and add my debit card and hopefully purchase some Bitcoin for the first time. So I go ahead and do that. They have you verify your bank account by checking uh, some transactions that they make in your account. Finally, I'm on my dashboard. I can buy some Bitcoin. This is the moment I've been waiting for. The pie is within reach. And no, I still have to submit ID and photo verification. <laughs> OK. But I really want the Bitcoin, so I go ahead and I do that. And they send me an email. And the page updates. And now I'm going to buy my $10 worth of Bitcoin, except no, I can only buy $5 worth of cryptocurrency with this account. That's not a great user experience, would you agree? <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Coinbase is an extremely important part of our ecosystem as, a, as cryptocurrency goes, and it's a lot better than it was five years ago. Trust me, if you've tried to buy a Bitcoin or any cryptocurrencies in the past, this experience is much, much better. But it's still not quite where we want it to be when it comes to getting grandma to buy Bitcoin, right? So let's talk about user experience. I think it's important to, to determine the difference between UX and UI, because I hear them kind of used interchangeably quite a bit. So I really like this analogy of the ketchup bottles. I'm sure everyone's had one of these glass ketchup bottles before. Feels really nice. It looks really nice. But it's impossible to get ketchup out of. You're banging on it. There's absolutely no way. It doesn't make any sense. You're shaking it up and down. Finally, you just grab a knife and, and drag ketchup out onto your burger, your fries, whatever you're eating. It's a good product with a poor UX. A good UX with the same product would be the plastic ketchup bottle. The ketchup's already at the cap. It's kind of upside down, if you will, and it squeezes right out. Anybody, even people who somehow haven't had ketchup before, could easily get ketchup out of that bottle. Unfortunately, with crypto, we're not even at the glass bottle. We're like smashing tomatoes with our hands right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to get to at least the, ketchup, the glass ketchup bottle, right? So let's look at the issues within the UI aspect of crypto. It's confusing. It's unintuitive. It lacks any real detail or standardization. And truly, it's, it's very ugly, most of the apps. I'm not, I'm not trying to generalize too much here, but we can pretty much say generally <laughs> most of the apps are pretty ugly. <laughs> here is an example of two. These are two, actually, different wallets. On the, on the left is Dash, and on the right is Gincoin. Again, nothing against either of these projects. They have great product offerings, but we're talking about UI here, right? So if I was a new user and I was to open up either one of these wallets, I would be completely confused. There's a lot of jargon. It's pretty dated looking. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be doing. And of course, they're going to want to send you to some YouTube video or blog so that you can actually learn what this thing does. That's not what users expect when they're using a new application. They're, they're used to having the tutorial take them around the wallet and tell them what's going on. The other issue with this is that Jin, which is a much newer coin, essentially, do you guys see any similarities between those two? They look like I do. So that's a problem, because we're actually perpetuating the standard. 
We're creating a poor standard and perpetuating it by copy and pasting it. We need to stop doing that. We need to start innovating on our interfaces so that there are new and better innovations all of the time. Here's an example of, sorry for the shameless plug, but this is my company's uh, mobile, or desktop wallet, excuse me. And it's much more understandable, it's much more familiar. You have things like uh, the asset values in US dollars, there's tool tips all around the wallet, the, uh, the accounts are named so you can see where the money is going to and from. It's a better interface, but it's still not necessarily the user experience, and again, this is my product we're talking about, that we're trying to achieve, but we're working on it all the time, right? So we really need to start thinking about how to improve that experience, starting with the issues. The current, uh, the current products that are available elicit a sense of fear, they're unfamiliar, and most people get frustrated to the point of quitting uh, with most of these apps. Here are a few examples. This is a mobile wallet on the far left that's literally warning you if you lose your account information, you lose your funds forever. If you've never used cryptocurrency before, but you've maybe used PayPal or Venmo, and you see that, aren't you scared? Why should I use this? If I lose my phone, my money's gone? I don't want to deal with that. With uh, sending money, it's small increments to these crazy addresses of numbers and letters. That's really unfamiliar to people. And then finally, if you do happen to write down your seed phrase to recover it, it's also relatively complex. You have red wording, things that say stop. That's not a good experience or interface for new users. This is uh, a mobile wallet that we're developing that, in my opinion, is a much better experience. This takes you through just a basic transaction. So you can see that it's a much more familiar look. It looks more like a PayPal or a Venmo. You can send using US dollar values. You can search people's usernames, pass or I'm sorry, not passwords. You can search their <laughs> username um, or email address, what have you, and you can see that they have a picture. And these are things that are still decentralized in our blockchain using uh, sort of a, uh, what Namecoin did, if you guys know what Namecoin is. Uh, I won't get too deep into the technicals. You can find me after if you're more interested in how we decentralized these particular features. But again, this is just a more familiarized experience. I think people have a, a better feel, less fear when they're using this type of application. But it's still just a product, right? There's, in order to really create an experience that people want to become loyal to, you need more than just a good product or a good UX, right? A, U a UX in one product should uh, sort of transfer to every product in your ecosystem, right? So there's a difference between a product and an ecosystem. And I think the best example of an ecosystem that dominated our world would be Apple. Apple's sort of baseline is the, is the iCloud, right? You can, you can connect all of your devices to the iCloud and all of your devices actually connect to one another. So you are never without whatever piece of data that you want, whether it be your pictures or your movies, music, what have you, it's all accessible from anywhere all the time. That kind of experience, as we've seen, turned Apple into the biggest company on Earth. And that's sort of the kind of methodology that I think we should try to adopt. But there's, so that's the ecosystem. Right now, I think what cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or whichever one you want to look at is more of a product, like the BlackBerry. The BlackBerry didn't succeed in dominating, even in the business world, because it really didn't expand outside of its niche. It was a great business phone, but what else could you do with it? They tried to have different product lines and stuff like that, but they never did that, right? They never had this sort of loyalty, this sort of closed-looped ecosystem. So we've tried to adopt the same thing at Divi. Um, so this is sort of our ecosystem roadmap, if you will. Um, some of these things do exist already. Some of them are in testing. But basically, you have a desktop and mobile wallet. You have Lightning Network. You have master nodes and proof of stake so people can earn easily. You have human readable addresses, so you don't have these long strings of numbers and letters. But most importantly, you have one-click and no-click solutions. And that's something that we completely stole from Steve Jobs. He was all about having the less clicks you could possibly have to get to the value that the customer wants. I'm going to, I probably don't have too much time left, but I, I want to tell you about one of our one-click solutions that has sort of served as a proof of concept for this methodology. And it's our one-click masternode. 
Does anyone know what a master node is? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. No one. <laughs> so a master node is essentially it's a full node uh, of the block. Um, sorry, a full node carrying a complete copy of the blockchain in real time and secures the network's transactions. It's similar to mining. You guys know what Bitcoin mining is, right? So it's similar to mining, but it's 99% more eco-friendly and it's far more energy efficient. Um, so you don't need like a crazy mining rig. You can actually do it on a, on a private server in the cloud if you wanted to, like a $5 droplet on DigitalOcean is adequate. So that's great, right? That'd be like the easiest way to earn cryptocurrency. Seems like the best way to access. The problem is that most of these master nodes are incredibly difficult to set up. They even, going back to scaring your users away, on their websites say things like, setting up your own master node can be hard work if you don't have technical knowledge. This guide assumes basic understanding of PuTTY and Linux. You're just telling people, like, don't do it, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> we created the first one-clicked process, and this is just a quick video that shows you how it works. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, it takes about 18 minutes, but the user interaction only takes about three. Um, and this is right from your smart wallet, the Divi desktop wallet. So we have five levels of entry uh, that you can access. You subscribe just like you would with anything else online with PayPal. Uh, in the future, we will add cryptocurrency payments, um, but that gets a little difficult with subscriptions. Um, but now with time lock contracts, that's becoming a reality, which is amazing. So once you pay, you simply name your master node, click deploy, and you're off. No knowledge of PuTTY or Linux or anything else, and you can actually start earning cryptocurrency in minutes. So these are the types of one-click, no-click solutions that we should be aiming to build for our users in cryptocurrency. And um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> cool. That is really good.